أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وولي أمرنا وصاحب نعمتنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, the Imam of the time, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari, recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There comes a point when, let's say, you've been in a business transaction and you've had a falling out with a partner or in any number of cases where you develop resentment and antagonism and an enemy wants to hurt you. Now that enemy could be someone who is feeble and weak. And so you suspect that at some point he's going to do something, but not now. And so according to your assessment, if this person is going to do something to hurt you, it'll probably take them five years to do so. And so of course, you have to take precautions and you have to try and protect your interests, your family, yourself, to ensure that you build a deterrent so that that person doesn't hurt you or if they try to, they're not successful. But then again, there are times when you assess the situation And because 
the person might actually come and threaten you to your face and say that I'll come and do X, Y, and Z. And you deem that threat to be credible. At this point, you have to take precautions in a manner that addresses the problem and sees it as an imminent threat. This is code blue. This isn't a time for complacency. You can't just say, well, I'll try and maybe do something about it. Maybe I'll talk to my lawyer. I'll talk to some of my friends. When you know that this person is going to attack tonight or tomorrow or over the next week. And so what you do naturally is you would take some measures to protect the safety of yourself and your family. You might install security cameras outside your house. You might reinforce the front door. You might even change the locks, right? You take measures that are proportionate to the imminent threat against your life or the life of your loved ones. If you remember last night, we talked about how we are at such a critical juncture where there is no room for complacency. We find ourselves at the end of the cycle of this threat. And I cited examples of actual manifestos that have been authored 30 years ago, which talk about how the roadmap towards the erosion of morality in society is such that places us squarely at the very end. Not the beginning, not the middle, but at the very end, which means that the threat is now truly imminent. According to our traditions, we have a large corpus of hadith that describe what we refer to as the end of days. Akhiru zaman. Now, Akhiru zaman is something that requires its own discussion at length. But in a nutshell, it incorporates several stages. So there's no one Akhiru zaman because it spans many, many years and therefore it needs further analysis. It's not just one moment where there is a bang and then it's Akhiru zaman and that it ends with the reappearance of the 12th Imam. No. It's something that's, while it's gradual, but it does go through various phases. And we, according to the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, we find ourselves in at least the first phase of Akhir zaman There could be things that happen down the line, as per our traditions, which haven't happened yet. But what we do know for a fact is that we are at at least at the beginning of the cycle, which means the threats are imminent. We need to be protected. We need to take precautionary measures. And we need to do so as a matter of urgency. Not something we could just sleep off. We can't just sit there and say, no, no, it's not as bad as you think. Right? Yeah, let's try and plan ahead maybe over the next 20 years or so. Which, by the way, there is no vision. There is no roadmap. Sadly. Nobody's thinking that far ahead. Let alone thinking about addressing the imminent threat that faces us at this present moment. And so the hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt talk about the end of days. There are descriptions provided and there are prescriptions provided as well. The problems that will emerge towards the end of days and how to deal with them, how to address them. And so if we're not familiar with these, we won't be ready when the threat comes. You see, there's a difference between a country that experiences catastrophic floods, for instance, once every 100 years, and one that has a real problem dealing with floods because they have a lot of rivers, for instance, or because they have to live on the shoreline. These two countries or these two cities will deal with the problem in very different ways. 
Japan is a country that experiences many, many earthquakes, hundreds of them. Some of these earthquakes are truly devastating, and yet, the way they deal with these earthquakes, because they take those precautionary measures, because they're prepared for them, and they recognize and acknowledge the threat, the casualties and the damage that occurs after these earthquakes are minimal. Whereas one of the earth, earthquakes that takes place in Japan, the mid-range ones, you know, not the eight, nine Richter scale ones, but you know, let's say those at four or five. If they happened in a third world country, if they happened in a place that's ill-prepared for this disaster, you will find tens of thousands of people dying, hundreds of billions of dollars in economic damage. And so, number one, let's recognize the threat. Let us appreciate the gravity of the moment that we're in. That because this is the first phase of the end of days, it means that the problems, the challenges, the catastrophes and the disasters will intensify greatly. And that they are much worse than anything we've ever experienced in the past. Why? Because the techniques, the threats have evolved. They've become much more sophisticated than they were 50 years ago or 200 years ago. And so number one, acknowledge the level of the threat. Acknowledge the danger that lurks. Number two, let's prepare for them. One hadith in Mustadrak al-Wasail by Al-Mirza Nuri radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi For instance, speaking about the end of days Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma He says Ya'ti ala ummati zamanun There is going to be a time that my nation will go through where he says, number one, They won't be able to recognize a scholar unless that scholar is very well dressed. In other words, they, as we saw colloquially, they will judge the book by its cover. They'll judge a scholar and the level of knowledge that he has in proportion to how well dressed he is to whether or not he's wearing brand names, to how presentable he is, to how well-groomed he is. Whereas we know that there is no proportionality between possessing knowledge and looking good, right? Someone who does this is a performer. Again, nobody is saying that you shouldn't wear nice clothes. But to associate these two qualities... Wearing good clothes, being fashion conscious, and being a scholar, that's the disaster. That's how they will identify a scholar. That's how they will choose who to follow, who to listen to. So number one, لا يعرفون العلماء إلا بثياب حسن, بثوب حسن, بلبس حسن. Number two, and they won't recognize the Quran إلا بصوت حسن. In other words, an association has been made between the Qur'an and beautiful, melodic recitation. Whereas the Qur'an, its essence isn't the way it's recited. In fact, we have a hadith against these newfound, melodic, singing-like voices. We have traditions against this. Traditions tell us that when you recite the Qur'an, do so bisawtin hazin. Which I think in this day and age, the closest semblance to this is probably the Iraqi style, which is sad. The Prophet says that they will only recognize the Quran if it's recited in a very beautiful way. In other words, there's no focus on the content, on the essence of the Quran, the focus is on the voice. Number two. Number three, the Prophet says, they will only worship Allah during the holy month of Ramadan. This is 1400 years ago. 
the Prophet then says that when that happens, tyrants will rule over them. Tyrants who lack mercy in their hearts and who are ignorant to the core. One thing leads to another. Another hadith by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ He quotes Rasulullah. He says, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ What will you do on this day when it comes to you? كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا فَسَدَتْ نِسَاءُكُمْ وَفَسَقَ شَبَابُكُمْ وَلَمْ تَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ تَنْهَوْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ The day when your women will be spoiled. Spoiled meaning they will rot. Which is probably something that explains the difference between فَسَدَتْ نِسَاءُكُمْ وَفَسَقَ شَبَابُكُمْ the difference is that the women will rot secretly on the inside. Shame and decency and these things will be eroded. Whereas with the men and the youth who are male, fasaqu, they will outwardly and openly and conspicuously start committing sins in public. كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا فَسَدَتْ نِسَاءُكُمْ وَفَسَقَ شَبَابُكُمْ وَلَمْ تَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ تَنْهَوْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ It'll be a time when people stop enjoining the good and forbidding evil. Even though these are two obligatory acts in Islam that apply to everyone, not just the scholars. Every single person. You see something evil being committed, a sin taking place, you have to speak out. At least as much as you possibly can. And given all the conditions that have to be satisfied. But ultimately, the obligation is there. Enjoin good. Invite others to the way of Allah. It's salah time. Everybody's sitting, talking, wasting time. Brothers, sisters, let's get up and pray. You see a sin being committed, tell them. Speak out. Frown. Walk away. So they said to the Prophet, it's a famous hadith, they said to him, Is that even possible? Could that day ever happen? The Prophet said, It gets even worse. You think this is the worst of it? There will come a day when you will enjoin evil and forbid good. So they say to him, Ya Rasulullah, he said, It gets even worse than that. Can you imagine? The Prophet said, There will come a day when you will see good as evil and evil as good. Not only will you command people to commit evil, no, you won't even see evil as evil. You'll see it as good. Your entire moral system will be deformed and transfigured, and completely destroyed. These are hints, and I'm sure you're all intelligent enough to understand what we're talking about here, and how we truly are in this phase of the end of days. So in these ahadith, the Prophet and the Imams have provided us with clear warnings that it's going to get really bad. And it's in those days that you need to take precautions. In fact, in this famous hadith, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, the Holy Prophet says, يَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ الْمَاسِكُ لِدِينِهِ كَالْقَابِضِ عَلَى الْجَمْرِ There will come a day when the one who wants to be committed to their faith, those who wish to devote their lives to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his obedience, those who want to remain true to their values will be like a person who's holding a burning coal. If you've ever been close to a burning coal, if you've ever touched a match that's just been put out, getting any close to any kind of flame, you'll know how painful this is. Imagine... Closing your fist on an ember, on a burning coal. The Prophet says, this is how bad it's going to get. It'll be very difficult, very challenging. Now, if I knew this, 
and I prepared for it, then I would take measures to ensure that I'm able to withstand the pressures, avoid the pitfalls, and remain on the path of my salvation. If someone didn't know that this coal was still alive, still burning, and touched it, they'll burn their hands. But if I knew that the coal was burning, what I would then do is I would take some precautionary measures. I might use tonsils. I might wear a glove. I might do things that would allow me to hold it without burning my hand. Again, the biggest problem we have is ignorance, brothers and sisters. It's the fact that we don't recognize the threat. We're like someone who's insane. Someone who's delusional. Thinking the world is all hunky-dory. It's all, you know, unicorns and butterflies. And there's no danger whatsoever. Yeah, maybe there's a few problems here and there. But they won't affect me. They'll affect the neighbors. They'll affect, you know, people down the street. But not me. My kids are safe. Who told you your kids are safe? Listen to this hadith by Amir al-Mu'mineen. And it connects back to our discussion last night. The imam says, Badiru ahdathakum qabla an tasbiqa ilayhim al Listen very carefully to what the imam is saying. Badiru is different from ihfadu. The imam could have said, protect your youth before deviant groups reach them, right? The imam, the imam uses a different vernacular. He says, Badiru. Badiru means to take the initiative. It means to engage in action that prevents the harm from reaching them to begin with. It means ensuring that my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, myself are protected in case the danger reaches them. It's what they call in military lingo a preemptive strike. You take preemptive strikes so that the next time your kid watches a video that, confu that should otherwise confuse them, they're not confused. Why? Because their beliefs are solid. Because they know who to turn to if they ever had any questions. Badiru ahdathakum. al murja was a group of people who, it was a deviant group, they used to believe that uh, you can't judge anyone. Now, it's something that we see in this day and age as well. There's been a resurgence, a rebirth of murja. That you're not allowed to judge anybody. That whatever they do, it's all in God's hands. God is the only one who judges them. God is the only one who judges me. Murji'a, it means to refer them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is merciful. Allah is compassionate. Allah is a loving Lord. And so, there's not much we need to worry about. Al murji'a. The Imam said, Badiru ahdathakum. Ahdath means youth. Take the initiative, engage in a preemptive action to ensure that your youth don't fall prey to the predatory actions of these deviant groups. Whoever they may be, you can replace al murja without anyone. As we've been saying in the past, we are the targets of an intense campaign of manipulation without us even knowing about it in fact there is an entire science devoted to the manipulation and the exploitation of consumers to boost sales and to increase revenue by companies and it's called behavioral economics have you heard that term before behavioral marketing the idea is to exploit our mindless nature when it comes to buying things and nudge us in a direction that produces more sales and therefore more revenue. And there are many, many examples of that. I was speaking to an expert on the topic and it's shocking. It's shocking how many techniques they use that we're completely ambivalent about. We have no clue 
that we are being nudged and we are being prodded and we're, we're being pushed into a particular direction. I'll give you a couple of examples and you can relate. The power of free. They say instead of telling someone that I'm going to give you a 50% discount, tell them buy one, get one free. It's the same thing. But when people hear the word free, they're excited, right? It tickles their impulses to purchase because for the same price, I can get not one, but two of the same product. Whereas had you told them, I'll give you a discount, it's, it's difficult to, to push someone to making an impulse purchase just by telling them that you're getting a discount. Well, how much is a discount? 50%? Maybe I could get 70%. But buy one, get one free? Another example of behavioral marketing is irrational value assessment, which basically boils down to the more expensive the item is, the more you will enjoy it. Not because it provides you with any real added value, just because the price tag is higher, you will enjoy it more and you will think that this is a better product. And there have been many studies done about this. For instance, uh, in the automobile industry, they priced this car unreasonably high, even though it was like a mid-range car, nothing special about it. But they ended up making more sales because they priced it higher. It's counterintuitive, I know. You're probably thinking to yourself, this doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, you know, the, the, the consumer in this day and age, they're very well informed. They watch all these reviews and whatnot. But the reality is that they're making more and more money. Why do you think the rich are getting richer and richer? The billionaires are, you know, now talking about becoming trillionaires. They're making more money because we're becoming more mindless, because the techniques used are more subliminal, more cunning. And they push us around with us without us thinking about them. Another example is, you know how when you're about to subscribe to some service online or you're about to buy something, and what they do is they call it a decoy alternative. So they present you with three different options. This is especially true of subscription services. They give you three different options. The basic, the mid-range, and the full-fledged option. The full-fledged is usually pretty expensive. In fact, it's out of proportion. The basic would be like $20 a month. The mid-range would be like $30 a month. The full-fledged is like $150. The whole point of the full-fledged, more expensive option was to act as a decoy. It is to make the mid-range option seem more reasonable. And so more people buy this, more people subscribe to this service because they feel like, oh, wow, I'm getting such a good offer. When in fact, that was the plan all along. A friend of mine who's a photographer, he was telling me that when it comes to wedding photography, people walk into my studio and we give them three options, three packages. We tell them we've got the $500 package, the $1,500 package, and the $7,000 package. He said, I want them to go for the $1,500 package. That's why I've inflated the price of the more expensive, the third option, the third package, to nudge them into the middle one. Right? And these techniques are used everywhere. From your local supermarket, the products that are placed at the checkout counter, right? The things you feel an impulse to buy at the very end when you're all done with your shopping. You think you've got everything you need and yet when you get to the checkout counter, there's like another 50 products there. Or when they place the milk all the way at the very end of the supermarket. Unreasonably far. It doesn't add up. Milk is like one of the mo most popular products in a supermarket. It's what people buy the most. But they put it all the way there to make sure you walk through the aisles and along the way, you see so many other things that you think you need or you think you want to buy so that you could, you know, make that recipe you've always wanted to make and buy more products. Increasing the size of the shopping cart. The, again, many studies of, of, of this have been done in the United States especially, which is the pioneer of behavioral economics, right? When Walmart increased the size of the shopping cart by 30%, they also increased sales by 30%, in fact, more than 30%. Because you don't want to see an empty shopping cart, right? The trolley. 
it's, if it's really big and all you've got is five items, you feel like, listen, I've come all the way here, all right? And I've bought a couple of items. I might as well just stock up, right? As well as the fact that most restaurants use red light. And studies have been done to prove that red light encourages people to eat more and to consume food faster. I mean, it's unbelievable. The expert that I cited earlier, he was telling me that there is entire think tanks, entire research centers that are devoted to getting people to gamble at casinos in Las Vegas using hundreds of techniques like this. From the way the road to the casino is engineered to swivel around instead of be a straight line because they've done studies to suggest that that makes you want to gamble more or spend more time there. From whether or not the chairs that they sit on when they're gambling have an armrest or not or when they're using the slot machines. If it has armrests, it encourages people to sit there longer. From the fact that if you win anything on the slot machines, it, make, it makes this big, you know, loud noise, whether you're, you've won a dollar or $10,000. It doesn't matter. So when you're walking around it, you keep hearing people winning things in the slot machines. And you think that people are making tens of thousands of dollars when all they're making is like $2, right? And ultimately, the house always wins, as they say. From the fact that they give them light alcohol just to make them tipsy, not strong enough to make them inebriated, but just to make them tipsy so as to make more, to, to take more risks. Or the fact that they dim the lights, which again, they say, makes people take greater risks, and so on and so forth. It's crazy the amount of money that's pumped into the marketing industry includes behavioral techniques to nudge us into buying more products, taking more risks, and making more money for the companies. Now, why do I say all of this? The reason I'm saying it is you need to know that when it comes to increasing revenue for these corporations, this is what they do. What do you think they would do when it comes to stealing your values and destroying your faith and your religion? Do you think they're just going to sit back and wait for people to volunteer their values? When Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Man nama lam yunam an, The one who's sleeping doesn't realize that the enemy is wide awake. The enemy is plotting and scheming and working much harder than you and I will ever work to ensure that they will use these subliminal techniques, these submersive methods in order to change your values, in order to manipulate you into adopting an entirely different value system to upend morality. Now, one of those dangers that we, we need to be mindful of, one of the greatest threats to faith, to religion, to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is not only a danger today, but has existed for a very long time, since the ancient times, is what I'd like to refer to as a cosmic monistic philosophy or a cosmic monistic pantheism. The idea is rather simple, though also they make it very complicated. The idea is that there is no distinction between the creator of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his creation. In Arabic, this concept is referred to as Wahdatul Wujud or the unity of existence. Now, there are variations of this. There are different flavors of this, right? The most extreme is what's been elucidated by the likes of Mullah Hadi Sabzawari. Mullah Hadi Sabzawari says in his Manzuma and the commentary on the Manzuma, which is a very famous work that studied 
within the uh, mystical, philosophical uh, discipline, he says that, look, we have different kind of people, and each subset, each group of people, has a different kind of view of God. He says that we have the awam. Remember when I said that one of the techniques used to establish new religions is elitism? It's to say that, look, what we have is exclusive to us. This is only for the elite. It's for the best of the best, the cream of the crop. Whereas you have these people who are worthless. They might believe in other things. They're wrong, of course. What we have is the truth. They claim exclusivity to the truth. Mullah Hadis Abzawari spells this out very clearly. He says we have Tawheed al-Awam. These are the simpletons. These are the average blue-collar workers, the farmers, you know, the drivers, the ones who go to the majalis, you know, the, the normal peasants. And they believe that there is a creator and there is a creation. But of course, that's not accurate. That's not true. Then he goes a step up in the ladder. He says, then we have what he calls Tawheed al-Khawas. I think it's four stages, but again, for the sake of brevity, I'll make it brief. He says, we have Tawheed al-Khawas, the elites, the inner circle of whoever holds the banner to the truth. He says, these people believe in Wahdatul Wujud, that existence is one thing. Everything in it is part of one essence. God, creation, while they may look as though there is a plurality, it looks like there is different people and different objects and different countries and different cities and so forth, different substances, right? But the reality is they're all one thing. Then he says there is what he calls Tawheedu Akhas al Khawas, the elite of the elite, right? The Ibn Arabis and the Rumis and the, you know, these people. And they believe that there is no plurality. It's all one thing. This is just a shadow. What you're seeing is a mirage. It's a shadow. The reality, the truth, you're blinded. You need to polish the mirror. And they use all these, you know, esoteric and intriguing expressions. Your mirror is too dirty to see the truth, to see God. You need to polish the mirror. You need to use innovative means of polishing the mirror and doing things that are bid'ah in essence in order to see the truth, the reality of it. As Mansur al-Hallaj said that I went to Hajj, the first time I saw the house, I didn't see the Lord of the house. The second time I went, I saw the Lord of the house, but not the house. Then the third time I went there, I didn't see the house, nor the Lord of the house, nor anything else. It was all one reality. Allahu Akbar. And people hear this from the pulpit. From the pulpit of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Deviance to the core. Nawasib. And this is being spewed from this sacred institution. Polish the mirror. Why couldn't the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt speak like this? Why don't you have a single hadith? where the Imams even mention Wahdatul Wujud. You'd think that if this was the reality of the universe, then the Imams would have talked about it. And so we and God are just one essence. And they use all kinds of examples, right? Picks this up and says, see, this is existence. God exists. Therefore, we also exist. Therefore, it's one thing because if it was outside, Using a napkin to explain, to, to try and describe Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ Do not ascribe examples to Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُوا أَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah knows you don't. How could an ant try and encompass the ocean? How could this insignificant intrinsically poor human being encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let alone be a part of God's essence in other words they insert Allah 
into his creation, into the physical realm, and then say, oh, see, subhanAllah, it all adds up. Ascribing examples to Allah, which the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt never did, which are contradictory and antithetical to our beliefs. Saying that we are somehow part of the essence of Allah. Ascribing false names to Allah. Allah is existence, says who? Where is Al Wujud as part of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ya Wujud? We say, Ya Mawjood. Oh, one who exists. He's not existence itself. Allah is knowledge. Who said Allah is knowledge? Allah is knowledgeable. We never say in the Quran, in our scriptural references, in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, there's not a single name of Allah that reads, Ya Ilm. And Imam al-Baqir, when he says, لا تسم الله إلا بما سمى به نفسه Do not ascribe a name to Allah except the ones that he ascribed to himself. Why? Because this leads to zandaqa. This leads to polytheism or outright rejection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these examples, as I mentioned before, we are like waves, waves to the ocean, rays to the sun. Where is this found in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt? You'd think that Amir al-Mu'mineen who speaks about Tawheed in the most sublime way, that at some point he would have said, you know what? We are like waves to the ocean, rays to the sun. Why wouldn't they? Why did the Imams never speak like this? Because it's false. And do you know where it originated from? It originated from Jewish mysticism. What's called the Kabbalah. Hasidic teachings talk about this very openly. Right? This monistic philosophy where God and his creations are indistinguishable. There's no distinction. There's no separation between them. Whereas look at the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. They say very clearly... Allah is distinct from his creations. His creations are distinct from him. But then, of course, they cite verses from the Quran and traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. As they would, of course. If they didn't, you'd recognize immediately that they're nothing but imposters. So they'll say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to, uh, or says about Isa, he says, فَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي I blew my soul into him. Okay, first of all, if this meant what you think it means, then this applies to Isa alayhi salam. Not everything and everyone. Ibn Arabi says in the introduction of his book, he says, الحمد لله الذي خلق الأشياء وهو عينها Praise be to Allah who created things even though they are his essence. You and I are the essence of Allah according to Ibn Arabi. So number one, if this was true, this would apply to Isa because he is Ruhullah. You're not Ruhullah, number one. Number two, the hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt have interpreted this verse very clearly. They say, Men Ruhi is what's called ya al milkiya allah is saying that this soul the spirit that he blew into isa alayhi salam or in the womb of maryam alayhi salam belongs to allah it's like saying bayti imamati yadi rijli lisani when i say this is my house am i saying that the house and i are one and the same no, it belongs to me. Allah says, this is my soul that I blew into him, meaning the soul that belongs to me. Now, why would Allah distinguish this soul from every other soul? They all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is for tashrif, the ahadith tell us. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while he has angels who create the souls, or he has agents, whatever it is, they create the souls. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this case, created the soul himself. In other words, it was by his will that the soul was created. It doesn't mean that it's a part of God. 
What is this kufr? What is this shirk? But they'll take these verses, misinterpret them, misconstrue them, mistranslate them. La ilaha illallah means there is no God. There is nothing but God, they say. Nothing but God? Learn Arabic for God's sake before you sit on the pulpit. La ilaha illallah. Ask any six-year-old child, non-Arabic background. They'll say there is no God but Allah. It's not saying there is nothing but Allah. There is no deity worthy of worship than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha is not saying la shay'a. Or they'll say that, oh subhanallah, Amirul Mu'mineen said, ma ra'aytu shay'an illa wa ra'aytu Allah qablahu wa ba'dah. I'd hate to break it to you, but again, because you're an illiterate, you wouldn't know this, but I'll help you out. That's not a hadith. The Imam never said that. And even if he did, I have never seen anything except that I've seen Allah before it and after it. Even if this was a hadith, which it's not, but even if it was, it means that I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I recognize the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean that everything is a part of God. Where did you bring this from? Again, Kabbalah. There have been studies made about this. Tracing the unity of existence. A cosmic, monistic pantheism to Hasidic teachings. That's where they came from. And the Imams have told us, my dear brothers and sisters, they've told us, لا تأخذن معالم دينك إلا من عند شيعتنا. When do you want to seek knowledge when it comes to religion, when it comes to your beliefs? Take them from the closest of the companions of the Ahlul Bayt and the scholars of the faith. If you don't take your knowledge from the Shia, from the scholars, from the jurists, فَقَدْ أَخَذْتَهَا مِنْ الخائن. You've taken it from someone who has betrayed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will betray you as well. But that's the world we're living in. The pulpit of Abu Abdullah al Hussein used for monistic pantheism. That we and God are one and the same. It sounds like kufr, but it's not. How is it not kufr? When the Imam says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خِلْوًا مِنْ خَلْقِهِ وَخَلْقُهُ خِلْوًا مِنْ Imam al-Hasan al-Askari says that their scholars, meaning these mystics and these Sufis, شِرَارُ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ لِأَنَّهُمْ يَمِيلُونَ إِلَى الْفَلْسَفَةِ وَالتَّصَوُّفِ But I say, no, Ibn Arabi is a great sage and he's someone who can teach me the path to Allah. Ibn Arabi. Who says that number one, was the greatest of creation after Rasulullah. And number two was the second greatest creation after Rasulullah. Puts them above prophets. This person wants to teach me how to reach my salvation, how to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt were emphatic on how you need to be very careful and deliberate who you take your knowledge from. Don't just hand the reins to anybody. I'll mention just two more points and I'll wrap up inshallah. Ayatullah al-Uzma al-Sayyid Kazim al-Yazdi is the author of a book called Al-Urwatul Wuthqa. Al-Urwatul Wuthqa is a textbook that's read at the highest levels of the Islamic seminary, what's known as Dars al-Kharij. So far, so good. Dars al-Kharij is a commentary on al-Urwat al wuthqa So, in terms of seniority, in terms of significance, there's no question about it, right? Al-Urwat al wuthqa In it, he says, he speaks about najasat. It's a juristic book. He speaks about what is considered impure. Then he says, one of the things that are considered impure are nawasib, those who openly declare enmity towards the Ahlul Bayt. They are impure, najis. 
If you touch someone like that, you need to wash your hand before you pray. Okay? Like dogs, for instance. Then he says, as for those who believe in wahdatul wujud, if they openly practice the tenets of Islam, if they pray and they fast and they act like they're Muslims, then we can, we can, الأقوى عدم نجاستهم then we won't consider them to be ritually impure by essence if they exhibit behavior that looks like every other Muslim so we'll consider them Muslim right but what he's actually saying is that they are deviants because then he goes on to say he says that if they exhibit behavior akin to their beliefs that is connected to wahdatul wujud, then they become najis. Najis. Scholars provide a commentary on urwatul wuthqa. As I said, it's taught at the highest levels. And there are versions of urwatul wuthqa that include the commentary of ulama. If a alim disagrees with a point made by a Sayyid al-Yazdi, they will put their disagreement in the footnote. If they agree with it, they will leave it without a footnote, without a comment. The overwhelming majority of our jurists of the day have not left a footnote. They all agree with him. This is Sayyid Kadam al-Yazdi Sahib al-Urwa. This is one example. The other example is Sayyid Sistani. May Allah bless him and prolong his life. He was asked a question a couple of few years ago. The question was, do you subscribe to the mysticism and Arfan of Ibn Arabi. Because there have been reports, some have said, that you agree with Ibn Arabi, Sahib al-Fusus, as the question is, uh, uh, is, is written in this way. Do you believe in the mysticism of the author of Fusus al-Hikam? Because some have alleged that you do. The Sayyid responded in two lines. Using his own seal, not the office, but his own personal seal, which is very rare. The Sayyid says that I follow the school of the righteous and pious jurists of the Ahlul Bayt and therefore do not subscribe to the school of Sahib al Fusus. Meaning these are two distinct paths. One stretches all the way back to the Ahlul Bayt and one that has the likes of Ibn Arabi in them. My point is, brothers and sisters, and I do apologize, may Allah bless you all. Be careful who you take your religion from. Imam al-Baqir says, as he explains this verse in the Quran, let man look upon his food. It doesn't mean look at your food just in case there's like a hair strand in it or something not right. Because this is obvious. Everyone does this. Imam al-Baqir says, إِلَىٰ عِلْمِهِ Food for thought, knowledge. مِمَّنْ يَأْخُذُهُ Who are you taking this from? Take nothing from anyone except the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and their students and their jurists. Don't take anything from any random person. خُذُ الْحِكْمَةَ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِ الْكِلَابِ خُذُ الْحِكْمَةَ وَلَوْ مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ They'll tell you. Oh, take, take wisdom and knowledge even if it's a disbeliever, even if it's a dog. The hadith isn't saying خُذُ الْعِلْمَ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِ الْكِلَابِ It says خُذُ الْحِكْمَةَ Hikma means wisdom. Wisdom means if I am walking down the road and I throw something, right? If I litter, someone might come up and tell me this is wrong, you shouldn't do, do this. Littering is bad. In this case, it doesn't matter who the person is. It could be a Muslim, non-Muslim. This is just good general advice. Hygiene, hygiene. Wash your hand after you eat, for instance. It doesn't matter who says this to me, right? But when it comes to knowledge, who told you I can take it from anyone? You have to take it from the Ahlul Bayt and scholars who are linked to the Ahlul Bayt. اعرفوا منازل شيعتنا على قدر روايتهم عنا. Know the value and worth of our followers 
in accordance with whether or not they transmit our traditions, our teachings, our hadith. Be very careful. These manipulations, these techniques used in the hand of tyrannical regimes have destroyed entire nations. That's exactly what happened in Kufa. They employed these techniques to great effect. Sometimes by telling them that Hussein has decided to divide the Ummah. He's being sectarian. And so we need to respond. The last thing we want is division. Sometimes saying that he went against the word of his grandfather. Shurayh al-Qadi was paid to issue this verdict. Hussein ibn Ali is a deviant. Na'udhu billah. Sometimes by threatening people. Just straight up threatening them. If you go anywhere near Hussein or his emissaries or representatives, you will die. We will destroy you. And so the manipulation worked such that Muslim ibn Aqil was left all alone as a complete stranger in a city where he grew up in. Allahu Akbar. Amir al-Mu'mineen says in one hadith, Shaykh al-Saduq says this in his Amali. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen said to the Prophet one day, Ya Rasulullah, innaka latuhibbu aqilan. Do you love my brother aqil? The Prophet said, inni uhibbuhu hubbain. I love him. SubhanAllah, this hadith is full of hub, hub, hub. Alayhsa al-deenu illa al-hub. He said, I love him for two reasons. أحبه حبا له وأحبه حبا لأبي طالب له I love عقيل for him for his sake and I love him because Abu Talib used to love him then the prophet said وسيكون له ولد he will have a son يقتل في حب ولدك الحسين and he will be killed for his love for your son Hussein. Then the Prophet said, فَتَبْكِي عَلَيْهِ الْعُيُونَ طُوبَ لِمَنْ بَكَى عَلَيْهِ The eyes will cry for Muslim. May Allah bless those who cry for him, Rasulullah says. Then the Prophet cried, the hadith says, حَتَّى جَرَدْ دُمُوعُهُ عَلَى صَدْرِهِ His tears covered his entire chest. The Prophet then raised his head and he said, My complaint is to Allah for what they will do. Muslim ibn Aqil was truly special when Imam al Hussein sent him to Kufa in his mandate. The Imam stated to the people of Kufa, والثقة من أهل بيتي مسلم ابن عقيل I am sending to you my brother in that way Muslim was similar to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas my brother, my cousin and the trusted one among my family I am sending him to you if he says I should come, I will come if he says no, I won't go Subhanallah, Muslim ibn Aqil, with this rank, with this status, suddenly looked around and there was no one around him. The night passed. You're familiar with the story. In the morning, the army was already outside looking for him. Muslim ibn Aqil went out. He engaged with them in battle. He fought them off. There were 200 of them. And yet Muslim ibn Aqil overpowered them. He repelled them. So they sent word back to Ibn Ziyad, we need reinforcements. He said, you're only fighting one man. 
the commander said to Ibn Ziyad, you think you've sent us to a grocer in Kufa. You've sent us to the nephew of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You've sent us to a member of Bani Hashim. We need 200 more men to come. They began fighting him. Al Khawarizmi, who is a Hanafi Sunni historian and an author of one of the earliest maqatil, he says that he fought them with valor and bravery. But then when they realized that they can't defeat him, they sent people to the rooftops to start stoning him and throwing rocks and sticks and fire in his direction. Al Khawarizmi says that when that happened, Ibtasama Muslim ibn Aqil, he was seen smiling. Maybe one of the reasons was that he realized this would be the day he joins Amir al Mu'mineen. This is the day he's going to be martyred. Or maybe the other reason was that he thought to himself, better, than, better me than Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Come and get me, like Abbas ibn Shabib said. He continued to resist and fight, but then Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ath, this wicked, vile man, he said to him, Ya Muslim, laka al-aman la taqtul nafsak. You're wounded heavily, you're going to die. We will give you immunity, it's okay, we'll keep you alive. Anyone who's a brave fighter knows that it's better to fight than to surrender. So why did Muslims surrender? Because when they lied to him and told him that we will give you immunity he thought to himself maybe this will give me a chance to send news to Abba Abdullah al Hussein not to advance further to Kufa he surrendered they took him his wounds were gushing with blood they took him, they tried to humiliate him. But now when you go to Kufa and enter the courtyard of Masjid al-Kufa, you see the grandeur of Muslims. You say, Lillah al-Azzatu wa lil mu'mineen. But they tried nonetheless. They took him to the governor's mansion. He's gushing with blood. He's been fighting all day. He's parched and thirsty. He asks for water. They bring him a bowl. There was a cut just above his upper lip. As soon as he placed his lips on the bowl, the bowl was filled with blood. Some have said his teeth fell into the water. They changed it. They brought another bowl. This time again, it was filled with blood. They did that the third time. Muslim ibn Aqil realized that if he was going to go, he had to go like his master, Abba Abdullah, thirsty. This was a badge of honor that Imam al Hussein gave to Muslims that he would go in the same manner as Abba Abdullah and his companions. He didn't drink anything. Then he was ordered to go to the rooftop. When they took him up there, he started to cry. Someone said to him, Muhammad ibn al Ash'ath, he said, Someone like you, I just saw you fight like the brave of men. of men. I didn't expect to see you crying. He said, I'm not crying from myself. I sent a letter to Abu Abdullah saying, Ajjil ilayna al-Qudum. Oh Hussein, hurry to us. The city of Kufa is waiting for you. I am crying for the one who is carrying his women and children towards Kufa. I am crying for Abba Abdullah. Then he said to Muhammad ibn al Ash'ath, Here is some money that I have. Please take it. Just send someone towards Karbala. Someone to say what happened to Abba Abdullah. Then he said, May I pray? Do I have a few moments? They said, No, you can't. So all he did was turn towards Abba Abdullah. And he said, Assalamu alaik, ya Abba Abdullah. Peace be upon you, ya Abba Abdullah. Then they severed his head just as they did to Abba Abdullah. 
and threw his body over the rooftop to the ground. I say, Ya Mu'mineen, Muslim ibn Aqil was in Kufa, Imam al Hussein was on his way. When the Imam heard the news from two travelers that had come, they told him, we have news to share with you. Should we tell you here in front of your companions? Or do you want us to tell you this in secret? The Imam said, there are no secrets between me and my companions. Say what you have to say. As soon as they broke the news, the camp of Abba Abdullah became the loneliest of places. The highest number of deserters did so when they, when they were told that Muslim had been killed. Assalamu alaik. O oh, one who as long as you were alive, the children of Abba Abdullah felt safe. And as, as soon as you died, as soon as you were killed, they felt so lonely and estranged. The Imam then said, go bring me my niece Hamida bint Muslim. They brought Hamida the Imam put her on his lap. He began kissing her and wiping her head. She looked up, Ya Amma, why are you treating me the way you treat orphans? Has something happened to my father? He said, I am your father today. My daughters are your sisters. I say, Ya Abba Abdullah, you comforted Hamida bint Muslim when her father was killed. But where were you? Where were you at that hour when Sakina came to the killing pit to bid you farewell? And she was met with the lashes of those vile men. Hussein!